Uh, I'd like you to uh, listen to the first part, of course, this evening. Any emails, don't forget, of course, uh, just send them through to lt at bikerfm.co.uk. And if you hit the Facebook page also, and just do us a favour and just like the page, uh, it's it's pretty good, to be honest with you. Here's the first interview with Roger Lovelock. <coughs> well, a very good evening to you, uh, Roger Lovelock, uh, part of Driver Wolf. Uh, <laughs> How are you, mate? You, just, you apparently just got in from the shed after playing with your, playing with your bike this evening, getting it all sorted for 2013. Um, how's it been for you? Ah, good evening, Ty. Yes, um, yeah, been good so far. Um, like, um, you have to excuse me, my voice might be a bit uh, grouchy at the moment. I'm just getting over the, the lurgy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, all going well. Um, yeah, just trying to get all prepared for the up and coming season. It's uh, a bit of a rush at the moment, but uh, we'll get there in the end. There's probably might be one or two things that uh, we might forget about or leave to the last minute, but I'm sure we'll be up there ready to rock and roll. Uh, yeah, when we're should up there be at fine. Brands Arch. Should be fine. Now, just uh, just to uh, um, just to let everybody know who's listening in this evening, you are a firefighter, and uh, you did say to me before we had this meeting that uh, uh, that uh, it may go off during the interview. So as long as people understand, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, yeah. so anyway, moving along somewhat, uh, Roger. <laughs> yes. I'm sure everybody would like to know how long you've been racing inside cars because it's been a while, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Going back to the last century, I think it was. You know, <laughs> but uh, no, I've been racing what 20, 23 years. I think it was 1990. Although I did start a little bit late uh, in, in my days, I suppose. You know, most people start their racing career when they're in their teens, but I didn't really start until uh, my mid twenties. But uh, yeah, back in about 1990, um, okay. I started off uh, solo on a solo bike. Didn't really enjoy that much. It was mm. a bit scary for me. And um, a good friend of mine um, got me involved in sidecar racing, uh, late Tony Chilcutt, who mm -hmm. sadly lost his life at Thruxton a few years ago. And uh, a very good friend of mine got me involved in sidecar racing. And, uh, and uh, I've never looked back. And, uh, yeah, still doing it 20 years on. So... When you first started out, did uh, did the grass track uh, appeal to you, or was it hard track, if you know what I mean, the, the tarmac stuff? Well, like I said, um, it was Tony that really got me involved in it, and he was involved in uh, road racing at the time, but no, grass track or, you know, the uh, motocross side of things has never really interested me. It was just mm. something I fell into, really, with the road racing. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, got, got, got an old sidecar outfit and, um, uh, went road racing with it and sort of, like, took to ducks to water with it. And, uh, yeah, and, um, yeah, like, but, uh, no, the, um, the grass tracks, no, has not really appealed to me. Mm. I mean, I, I've been looking at some photographs, some really old photographs of both hard and grass, <laughs> and, um, how... It's amazing how the the sidecar has evolved over the years, from you know like a like a bog standard lump in a frame, and a, a very eerie sort of um, uh, how can I say sort of somewhere for the passenger to sit, and things like and how it's evolved over like the fairings and things like that that have been put on there now. Um, it's all to do with speed and timing, isn't it now? Well, abs absolutely. I mean, the modern Formula One sidecar. I mean, really, um, the the, the sidecar that the most is widely used on the tracks these days is the uh, LCR which is built by Louis Christian Racing in Switzerland mm. and he's been building these for um, 30 odd years now and to be quite honest where they really haven't changed the design of his he's, there's a few fundamental differences and alterations he's done to them but predominantly they've been you know the same for the last 30 years but prior to that most sidecars were of a tubular construction mm. um you know built with um you know tubes welded together and um you know and the suspension hanging off the tubes but the modern <laughs> uh formula one sidecar like i said is predominantly uh, the lcr which is a folded aluminium monocoque uh, uh chassis mm. with uh wheels and suspension hanging off the side of it with the engine also hanging off the side of it right. um but yes they do uh, look very much like formula one cars and um well with three wheels of course but um technology's there and um yeah they certainly are the state of the art these days yeah i, I mean I, I, I see you going around and so like i said to rick um or should we call him beetle belly i'm not <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> no funny i was i was at my girlfriend's at the time and she, well, he said you said he was a you know a skinny fellow and i 
Well, he is. He is, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I get to see him undress sometimes in the oh, coach, oh, and we dear. get ready for it to put our leathers on. He's got a bit of a beetle belly there sometimes. Oh, bless but, him. Uh, no. I should say no more on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, a, a thoroughly, li thoroughly nice bloke, I thought. Yeah, um, a really great guy. Yeah. And I mean, I've known him for years, but uh, he's really. It was really the interview went really well. We were so relaxed uh, with his dog. Uh, and son in the background it was so funny but uh, we were just admiring the bling that uh, was on his shelf at the time fantastic um, anyway moving along somewhat this is all about you this evening as a driver mm -hmm. um, just quickly what is it like sat, sat underneath that cockpit and because um, it looks bloody uncomfortable to be fair well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to defend myself here because, I mean, I've listened to Rick's interview, he said, ah, oh, the old drivers, they got an easy life in that cockpit, <laughs> you know, unless that's hanging on the back, you know. But, I mean, to be quite honest, well, I, I mean, you know, I, I suspect some of the other drivers out there listening to this, I would probably agree, it is quite tough in the cockpit, you know, you, you've got all the G-forces, you know, in the, cor in the cornering and then, you know, diving underneath on the brakes and accelerating hard, and it is quite tough in there, you know, mm. it's um, quite exhausting. And, um, the passenger, I suppose, to a certain degree, he can put himself into a position where he feels most comfortable. We, uh, up there in the front are, um, pretty much, uh, stuck where we're stuck. And, mm. uh, you know, I have to put up with the, um, the forces that are put upon us. But it is our hard work, and we are cramped in there, but, um, you know, make it last half an hour in a race, and that's what we got to do. Do you, do you sort of, like, um, prepare to be in that position for, because it's, what, 18 laps? Uh, also, I mean, d physically, you have to be not only mentally minded, but you have to be physically minded as well. When, when, sort of, you know, preparing yourself for these forces that are going to be imposed upon your body for that amount of time, obviously, you you have to have some element of fitness there. I would say. Well, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not getting any younger. I'm nearly hitting the big five oh now, and uh, my bones are starting to creak a bit, and it does get a bit painful when you get out. But as regards fitness. Um, I, I don't really do a lot, um, to be quite honest with you, I do play squash two or three times a week with a mm. good friend of mine down at the fire station, but other than that, no, I don't sort of uh, keep fit, I just tend to walk down to the high street every now and then and walk everywhere rather than drive everywhere, you know, mm. locally, um, but other than that, no, I just, uh, you know, uh, other than squash and that's about it really. Do you look at your weight? Uh, obviously before a race uh, a race meeting because that's obviously has a a compact effect on the performance of the sidecar as well so y are you conscious of your weight in any way no no not not me i mean some of the other teams might be but no i mean uh what i weigh is what i weigh sure. um sometimes talking about weight we might even add weight to the bike sometimes um uh, to certain tracks to get you know better traction in certain places but no, I, it's not not anything I really keep keep my eye on is me weight as long as I don't get too heavy and uh, you mm. know out of fitness. Um, but no, nah, but it's it's, it's, it it's important for the passenger surely because weight um, sort of makes a big difference on the back. I mean, I know he's a spindly little bloke with a with a beetle belly, but uh, <laughs> is he is he heavy? Do you think? Well, well, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, I think it's more important to have a balanced crew rather than, you know, a light driver and a heavy passenger yeah. or vice versa, you know. Um, I mean, me, <coughs> excuse me, me and Rick are quite uh, balanced, I think, you know. Mm. Um, and as he said, you know, it's a matter of putting the weight where, where I need it when I'm and ride, driving it, you know, yeah. on, on certain circuits and on certain corners, on certain straights, you know. Mm. Um, so he knows where to put his weight at the right time. Um, he's, he's definitely to get the grip he's, and the braking and yeah, so forth. He's definitely a pro at that. I've seen him. Um, uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I've had him on since two thousand and six. I can quite honestly say I can. You know, I haven't had anybody that's uh, sort of surpassed Rick mm. on and off the track. You know, he's he's. You know, it's not just about passenger in. It's all about the other stuff that goes with it as well. Mm. Um, and, and leading on to obviously more uh, passengers. How many passengers have you had on the back? Um, I, I, you know, I, it's quite, I want to say quite a few, but I mean, 20 years racing, you do tend to, you know, go through one or two passengers, but I don't know, it's probably about 25 passengers. I haven't really calculated, you know, worked them all out, but I suppose it must be around about 25 over the years. You know, some people might have only had for like half a meeting, you know, they mm. get on the bike, yeah, we're passenger, but they, you know, don't enjoy it that much and had, a, had enough, you know, and, uh, others I've had for a few years and Rick's probably, I think, been the longest now. Mm.
because he was saying he's been he's been with you since ninety three or, or or so on. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Sorry, yeah, my apologies. Two thousand six. Yeah. Uh, you've also had Steve English on the back as well as a passenger. Tell me more about that. Well, Steve, I don't think he's <laughs> he's been with more drivers than <laughs> anybody. <laughs> I think. But no, Steve. I mean, he's good. Um, he was on Ockenheim with me a few years ago when mm. we were doing one of the World Championship rounds, and I think you'd quite agree with that. He probably enjoyed that very much, so I certainly did. But no, Steve, he's a good passenger. Uh, you don't see him on the circuit so much now. He runs a website called steveenglish.org. Mm. And, um, but uh, no, uh, Steve is one of the well-known passengers around the paddock. Well, I'm hoping to get him on the show at some point. Uh, he's been a bit shy at the moment, bless him. Mm. Uh, but we'll get him on one day. But uh, how did you and Rick come about then? Um, well, we were running a... Going back a few years, we were running a two-bike... Well, just starting out to uh, run a two-bike team. Mm. Um, another sidecar friend of mine, Jerry Martin, um, we got involved with a team called TCR Racing, uh, Team Charwood Racing. Mm. Um, and... Um, it was a two bike team and I had a, a guy uh, called um, Mark uh, Mark Herod on the side mm. and um, we were racing and um, I ran over his hand <laughs> well he put his hand down on the ground at Brands Ash and I ran over it <laughs> and, uh, and it broke some fingers in oh, his you hand laugh. and you um, laugh <laughs> unfortunately he couldn't race for the rest of the year I put the word out and Rick came you know said alright I'll step in and and really the rest is history then and, and mark was due to come back home with me but mm. he, he didn't in the end but uh, <laughs> uh rick stayed with me ever since he's a glutton for punishment i think <laughs> <laughs> no we mustn't laugh at that but it, that's serious i mean that is very serious indeed but oh now we know then now we know where rick came about um so anyway let's move on uh somewhat now your engine for this year i mean rick was telling you telling me rather about the the new bmw that's going to be introduced is that a definite for this year yeah, we're on the cards for that. Um, whether we'll get the fairing to look really nice, because there's a huge, great big airbox that sits on the top of it. Um, mm. But we, we, you know, I've got one week to go. I've had it running. Um, it's just a few little bits to, you know, get to make it comfortable, like the gear change and a few other bits and pieces. I've got a guy working on the wiring loom because it's very complicated electronics on it. Mm. But, you know, I'm confident we should be there at Brands Hatch, um, you know, uh, trying it out or racing it. Um and hopefully we want to get on the dyno prior to that a few days before that but um it looks really promising and i'm really looking forward to it um but it's just one or two bits and pieces we've got to get ironed out but i mean the bulk of the work's all done now you know i've had some help from from from, from trevor Irison in swindon he's helped me out get it sorted out and um and some one or two other people um if i remember i'll mention them later on but no we'll be there at brands actually for the bmw no doubt about it perhaps i'm wrong when i say this but um i've noticed with all bmw engines i, I ride a bmw myself and um, they do have really large air boxes on the top of their vehicles uh, we, uh, is is it is it necessary well the well, I can't really speak for all the other BMWs because I'm not that familiar with them. But ah. I mean, I've got this 1000 RR S1000 RR engine, hmm. and it's got an air. I mean, most modern bikes have got big air boxes on them now. And um, hmm. in the past, we like with the Suzuki, we could always junk that and use what we called a jet air box that would fit nicely under the fairing. But because the BMW runs um, adjustable. Um, velocity stacks uh, inside the airbox mm. uh, driven by an electric motor which work on from throttle position engine speed and stuff like that you've got to retain all that um, otherwise you lose you can junk it but you'll lose so much power um, I've been ta talking to York Steinhausen about this he tried it at the beginning of last year and he said you've got to run the original airbox because otherwise if you start taking bits out of it um, you, you use, lose so much power mm. So, you know, we've got to... I mean, BMW spend millions of pounds developing these things, and, yeah. you know, quite frankly, you can't really go chucking it in the bin and expecting it to, you know, perform the same way as, you know, what it does after they spent all that money on it. So, no, we've got to retain the airbox on it, right. uh, you know, and keep all the, uh, you know, electronic gizmos inside it working properly. Mm. I mean, I run a K1200 uh, LT. <laughs> it's a bit of a bus, but it's got um, a lot of electronics, too many electronics. Uh, the, the, it, it, you know, you've only got to sneeze at it and I get a red light coming up on the dashboard. Um, that, that's 
uh, I'm put, it's BMW engineering, it's German engineering, um, it's been very, very, re the engine is bulletproof and I think you'll find exactly the same with the, uh, with the 1000 that you're using. Um, how I, I did try the 1600, uh, engine that they produced, uh, last, beginning of last year, I think, or the year before. Um, very impressive indeed. But, um, I mean, we're talking two different styles here, what it's like on the road or on the track. I mean, there's, there's totally two different ball games there, I would say. But you, you seem to be quite happy with this SS or RR engine, as they say. Well, I mean, yeah, like, I think Rick did mention in the, in his interview that we, uh, well, or uh, we've had to make another sump for it, uh, mm. which is, you know, the, the, the bit on the bottom, the engine that holds contains all the oil. Now, to get the engine lower in the chassis, um, we've obviously had to, you know, make a, a shorter or a less deep sump for it. Um, I just hope we don't oh, encounter any lubrication problems. Um, mm. you know, again, York Steinhausen has helped me on that by sending me some drawings through from Germany uh, to make a sump for it. Um, I've actually fabricated my own because uh, the time I was pushed for time couldn't um, get anybody to make one it was a bit of a, a, a difficult procedure on a CNC or something like that so I've actually made one myself um, and hopefully that works mm. um, what's the so cost what's the cost impl implications on something like that what on um, you mean what, on the sun yeah it well, must be quite I mean, expensive. you know, if you put a bit of thought into it, you can actually, the, the actual materials don't really cost a great deal. Um, you know, a bit of flat plate welded up and bent round and mm. machined off and whatever, and, you know, you've got something made for, you know, £50. But if you've got to machine something out of solid billet aluminium, put it on a CNC, then you're probably looking at four oh, or £500 maybe. to get it made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking about having something cast. Uh, maybe I've been looking into that, um, but I mean, if this this system what I've got works, and then I shall stay with it. I shan't I shan't worry about it. May may knock up another one because I've got a spare engine. You see, so I shall only want the uh, only want another one to go on the other engine just in case we need a quick engine change. But oh, uh, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say, uh, or dare I say, what happens if it uh, blows up? You've got a spare engine. Well, I have got a spare engine. The worst thing is if it blows up and you don't know why it's blown up, you know, if it's yep. a lubrication problem or overheating, mm. but uh, if something suddenly lets go for some reason, well, you need to investigate why it's done that before you start putting another engine in it. Mm. And, uh, it's too easy to, isn't it, to do that? Yeah, absolutely, because, I mean, you could be a fault outside of it that's, uh, that's causing it, you know, mm. and the last thing you want to do is go and put that in there and you go and uh, explode another engine, which is the last thing you want. Right, right. I mean, you've got some really good technicians there, uh, some good mechanics. Um, do you rely upon them? You know, are they are they doing their bit, if you know what I mean? Well, yeah, they all do their bit to help out. I mean, over the years, I've tried to do a lot of the stuff myself, obviously, to, you know, save save money. And, it's in, you know, I try and keep on the engineering side because I find it quite interesting, you know, hmm. uh, to keep, keep on top of it. And the, the, quite frankly, from my point of view, you know, the more I do on the bike, the more you sort of understand it and know how it's going to run and, you know, how it's put together and stuff like that. Mm. So, um, I tend to try to do, you know, do most of the stuff myself. Obviously, there are some things, you know, you know, you, I can't do because of, you know, you're limited on the, the machinery that you have to have to do this sort of thing and yeah. whatever. I mean, again, we're trying to get it down onto the dyno. That's something I can't do. And we're going to go down to Dyno Tech in Basingstoke, hopefully you know a few days before brands action put it on their machine and hopefully it runs up okay then mm. well, that's fantastic and look i'll tell you what we're gonna do we're gonna go and grab a drink yeah. um what would you like to listen to this evening in between in between yeah um well i did mention i, I quite like um like a bit of dean martin apparently a bit of dean martin that was right yes okay. well go make yourself a cuppa and we'll come yep. back soon and uh, chat again <laughs> 